My name is Mike Morantz. I'm Executive Director of Matthias Refugee Center. And I've spent the uh, first part of my career as a minister in churches throughout Ontario, but built a parallel career in the nonprofit community, doing a lot of work in poverty issues, housing, um, working with people with addictions and mental health issues. I joined Matthew House as Executive Director about two and a half years ago, um, knowing actually very little about refugees, didn't know the difference between refugee and refugee claimant, um, certainly didn't know the struggles that refugee claimants face. And uh, it's been very eye-opening, heartbreaking, but also inspiring as I've seen the men, women and children rebuild their lives here in Canada and get established in their own homes and jobs and cars. Um, so I'm loving every minute of it. Now you mentioned, um, not to dive, dive into quickly, but you did mention the difference between refugee and refugee claimant, which we believe is um, something that a lot of people don't know as well. So just take us through the differences, the legalese, and just the process of um, intake that Matthew House undergoes when the refugees come. Wow, I don't like talking that way. <laughs> really, instead of you know taking you through the legalese, mm -hmm. um, I just talk the same way I talk okay. to a donor or people in community. Okay. Um, really, everybody knows a refugee is somebody who has fled their home country because of fear of violence, persecution, war. Um, refugee claimants um, did not have a hearing in a refugee camp, did not get determined to be a convention refugee elsewhere. Um, but because of Canada's commitment to refugees under the Geneva Convention, mm -hmm. um, they arrive in our country and uh, we give them a hearing here. And we have a world-class system that has multiple streams, one specifically for refugee claimants, um, but there is a, a backlog on a hearing and those refugee claimants are not entitled to any federal government settlement supports um, when, they, when they arrive in Canada until they've had a successful hearing which means unlike government-assisted refugees, privately sponsored refugees, who have somebody to meet them at the airport, have somebody to help them find housing, get winter clothes, find a job, language classes, counseling, all of that stuff, refugee claimants are left on their own and often end up in our general homelessness system and really struggle to rebuild their lives. Matthew House steps into that gap and becomes home and family. We provide them with whatever support they need to become self-sufficient contributing members of community as quickly as possible. That's our goal, to see them, you know, within one year, two years, three years, be in employment education, starting their own business. And we see amazing results from that. I was sharing with you earlier from the point that um, our refugee claimants get um, their work permit to the point that they're employed, we're averaging about 10.2 days and most of them are off of Ontario Works within about three months after that. They are really hungry and just want to very quickly rebuild their lives. They're not looking to steal anybody's job, steal anybody's health care, certainly not wanting to sit on social assistance. Most of our refugee claimants are out looking for work before they get their work permit and uh, many of them have found jobs and are, are just waiting for that work permit. Um, to come and the moment that comes in the mail they call them up and say I'm ready to work let's go. And I mean you mentioned um, them being contributing members of societies as many of them were when they did leave their home country. Absolutely. Many of them had no choice as you um, through war conflicts and persecution some yeah. of them had no choice had not even enough time to grab anything and decide they have to flee with a drop of a dime That's to right. their families. Um, with their families some of them don't even make it across with their families. That's right. Um, just Take us, if you don't mind, just how do you, how, how do you, how do you, how do, we, how do, how does Matthew House receive refugees and says, where do they come from? How do they get here? Um, sure. Just because again, I think it's important for people to understand that they are human beings like us mm -hmm. who just have unfortunate circumstances through no choice of theirs. That's right. So um, just tell us how, how they get to us and then how they get to Matthew House and then we'll continue. From Absolutely. Matthew's. So the, we call them our friends from around the world. Okay. Um, our friends from around the world come from all over the world, every country on the map. And uh, it really depends on what's going on in the world, in their home country. Uh, there's a great poem, um, one line that always resonates with me, nobody leaves home unless the front door of home is the mouth of a shark. And uh, that's, that's the reality, that uh, every refugee claimant who comes to our door would rather be in their home country but it's not safe for them. 
and many of them have had to flee. Um, we've had, I think of one couple who came last year. Um, he was a veterinarian, a very successful practice in Venezuela. She was a uh, architect for the government. And uh, because of some corruption issues, they, the day that they left, they were working in their offices. And they had to flee. They ran home, grabbed some, some stuff and some cases, and, and got out of Dodge. And thank you. thankfully, they had the visas necessary to, to get into the United States and then were able to cross into Canada and, and make a refugee claim. Um, the journey is different. Uh, many of our friends from Nigeria were able to get visitors visas to the United States and then they crossed irregularly between border crossing points in Quebec, but that is not illegal. That's irregular, but because their purpose of doing so is to claim asylum and they do so within a timely manner, it's legal, evidenced by the fact that they're not charged, yes. right? They are, they are treated as soon as they say refugee claimant. The RCMP and the CBSA are amazingly welcoming um, and, and treat them with, with great respect. But that's only the beginning of their process of rebuilding their lives here in Canada. As far as getting actually to Matthew House, Windsor, um, we've been in existence over 16 years. We have provided a safe and welcoming first home for, uh, I think we're about just under 900 men, women and children now. And uh, they will tell other people. Um, I think one story I like to tell is that two men, uh, the first men that arrived at Matthew House after I became executive director, um, they fled their home country, Zimbabwe, and landed at Pearson Airport with $20 in their pocket. And they knew the name of one person from Zimbabwe. So they called that guy up and he said, oh, I don't know what you should do, but I know this woman and she lived at this shelter place in Windsor. So they called up um, our friend Angela, um, who had stayed at Matthew House, and we helped her get settled in community. Amazing story there. Um, uh, maybe I'll tell it to you in just a minute, but amazing story there. Angela packed up her kids, drove her minivan to Toronto, picked up these two guys and, and brought them to us. And they, and they stayed with us. Um, James is now working full time for a company here in Windsor and uh, Tunga is actually up in Toronto um, doing his, his law studies so that he can become a lawyer again here in, in Canada. So, I mean, you mentioned that story and it's important to realize that um, the activities of regular community members, it, forms a vital part in um, getting our refugees and our claimants settled and rehabilitated into a Canadian system when they arrive here. Absolutely. Especially in, in the pursuit of um, self-reliance and just being able to take care of themselves as well. Now Absolutely. you also do mention, you mentioned Nigeria, you mentioned Zimbabwe. What, um, so I mean majority of, majority of the refugees when we look at global statistics do come from African and Middle Eastern um, nations. Yep. Just take us through some of the demographics, just what kind of... Um, I find it interesting. I found, so we are part of a, uh, the Ontario Coalition of Service Providers for Refugee Claimants. And I think there's 28 organizations. And when we gather, we share um, kind of the numbers we're seeing in what countries. And it's interesting that the different shelters get different nationality. And I think part of that is the cultural groups that are already represented in a community. So um, we tend to get a lot of um, Latinos um, from, from Mexico, Venezuela, El Salvador, um, and, and Colombia and elsewhere, um, as well as those from the Middle East and, and uh, from, from Central Africa. Now, um, we recognize that this is, the refugee story is, is a story that has to be told. It definitely needs the global awareness. And it has to be told by them. And, it has to and be that's told the them. hard part because for them to tell their story is a hard thing. And, and I hope that somehow that is captured in your work that if you get anybody on video, that is a courageous thing for them to do, to share their story because first of all, they're having to relive it. And, and nobody wants to relive trauma. But second of all, reliving it in front of somebody else, reliving it on camera, um, that, that's a very big deal. And, and I don't think very many people would want to do that. So those who are willing to share their story um, deserve to be listened to even more, I think. It's a very, very true point. 
And now, um, what would you say about the misconceptions? Let's just address some of the misconceptions that are attached to refugees because we do understand the narrative in many places that they are maybe um, dependent on the economy, they engage in um, social vices because of their struggles and just having to find a way to make a living for themselves when they are brought into a country where they had to flee from, flee, flee into. So yeah. um, let's talk about some of those mis misconceptions and let's just talk about um, what should be done or what contributions that the general public should know and what, what it would mean to invest in the life of a refugee as well. Uh, let me start by saying that I think, I think some of the biggest causes of refugees in general struggling in their settlement in their new country is connected to the length of time that they're trapped in refugee camps. So refugee claimants, we have found, are very, very anxious to really quickly rebuild their lives. And I think in part because of how Matthew House and organizations like ours run our programming, that helps. But I think a lot, another big part is that they haven't been um, trapped in a refugee camp for a number of years. They haven't gotten discouraged. They haven't gotten used to somebody else taking care of them. They, in many cases, the men, women, and children, or well, men and women who arrive at Matthew House, the day they left their home country, were running businesses, were, were teaching other people's children, were lawyers in offices, um, and they really quickly want to rebuild their lives. And we see that. I shared with you earlier how quickly they get a job once they get a work permit. And what's really neat is I think I have about seven employers in this city now who are calling me all the time because they want to hire the men and women from Matthew House because they recognize that these are people who just want to rebuild their lives really quickly. They don't want to take from anybody else. They don't want to be on social assistance one day longer than they have to. Um, they, they want to rebuild their lives and, and get back to um, a, a place where they've got their own home, they've got the ability to take care of themselves and, and create a future for their children. As far as vices, um, in all honesty, I am surprised that I don't see more of it, right? I think if I went through some of the trauma that the men and women um, go through before they come to us, I probably would have started using drugs or alcohol. In two and a half years, we've not had, had any problems with the people who have come through here um, with, with drugs or alcohol. Um, they, they, again, are people who just want to rebuild their lives. One of the neat things is that they really quickly connect to community, whether that be a church group, a cultural group, a recreational group. Um, they want to connect. I think of one of our men um, from, from Iraq. Um, within about two days of moving in here, he somehow had made friends with three neighbors right in the neighborhood here from the Middle East. And, and I often see him sitting across the street on the front porch um, with one of the neighbors drinking coffee. They want to rebuild their lives. They want to develop community. They want to be part of Canadian culture and community. They don't want to subvert it. They don't want to change it into what it was back home. They want to be part of our Canadian family. Curious to know and very interesting to explore what it what such a situation means for them and what it does for their future and what it does for just emancipating them to move on. You know what I mean? So I'm not sure, especially the younger children, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that they would even identify as mm -hmm. being a refugee. I'm not sure they even quite get the concept. Mm -hmm. All they know, in many cases, is it wasn't safe at home, and we can't be there anymore. And from a social work perspective, I know that the loss of a home, and the loss of friends, the loss of community, is one of the biggest traumas for a child. It actually ranks higher than a single traumatic event, that like seeing you know the death of a of, of somebody or or being assaulted. When you have those things stripped away, that can have a deep lasting impact. But if that child can quickly land in a safe environment where they know that they are safe, 
where they have stability, where they, they get a sense that there's a future and some freedom for them, mm -hmm. that can be a very much a healing factor. One of the things I, I have struggled with and I've seen with refugees coming to Canada is the inability for us to give them as much of that stability as, as I think they need. So if, if a refugee has come to us directly from the border, great, they're with us, um, but then at some point they're going to have to leave here and they're going to hopefully go into rent gear to income housing or they might go to um, uh, market rental accommodations, but then if mom or dad can't afford that, then they might have to move again. And, and that lack of stability um, takes away from the healing factor. So really, if, I mean, it's not just for refugee claimants. Our cities across, across Canada, Ontario in particular, are crying out for more affordable housing. Um, here in Windsor, we have what I consider a crisis in lack of affordable housing. And uh, the government, if they want to produce better outcomes for not just refugee claimant children, but even Canadian citizen children, we need more affordable housing so families can have stable, safe, affordable housing. But beyond that, children who have had to flee their home country when they've had communities stripped away from them, you know, it's mom or dad may be with them, but the other parent may be still back in the home country. Grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, friends, not with them. So if we can help refugees as quickly as possible develop new relationships, new supporting relationships, that becomes very healing. So we have what we call our Canadian Friends Program. And what we try to do is match every one of our refugees with a established Canadian. So whether that be a long-term Canadian or somebody who's been here for three, four, five years, um, they're established in this country, they, they know the systems, they know the routines, um, and if they're willing to take one of our men or women out for a coffee or, or take to the grocery store and show them, this is where you can buy the African food, this is where you can buy the good fish, um, or have them over to their house for Christmas. Those become very much healing relationships that build resiliency in the children. When, when the children, we have birthday parties here. Um, just a couple of days ago, I mean, if you look on our Facebook, you'll see a picture. Um, I didn't even know it was happening. The families themselves threw this birthday party and every child in the building was invited. And, and that became a healing thing because now they've got a new community wrapped around them that builds those resiliency factors for those children. So anything that government or agencies can do to help build those resiliency factors would help. To the federal government, I would say welcoming refugee claimants, just like you welcome other refugees, is an investment in Canada and Ontario's economic prosperity. All the research shows that the more support they get in the first 30 to 90 days, the more successful they'll be. The quicker they'll be in an education employment starting their own business. Organizations like ours need your help to help them achieve that. Even if X percentage of them get sent back to their home country, the other ones stay here. The other ones start businesses. The other ones work in our workplaces, pay taxes. We need to invest in them so that they can as quickly as possible be successful. To donors and supporters, again, I would say, we need you to partner with us. The, the federal government at this point in time does not fund programs to support refugee claimants. So organizations like ours, uh, refugee centers in Toronto and elsewhere, are 100% donor funded. And if we don't receive funds from donors, we don't keep the lights on. We don't have staff to help people do their claim. We don't have the staff to help people find housing and then they're going to struggle. They're going to end up in the regular homelessness system. And many of them will struggle and, and possibly become those stereotypes that we talked about earlier. If we want people to succeed, sometimes they just need a little hand up, right? 
it's it's not a handout it's a matter of helping people just get on their feet again just like you would with any friend or any family member just putting a hand on the shoulder and saying it's going to be okay let's just take the next couple of steps together and then boom they're off so really to any Canadian I would say this if you can be a friend to a refugee claimant you can change a life if you can come alongside of them and journey as a friend for a few weeks a few months you can change your life you can help them very quickly become self-sufficient contributing members of your community or you can stand back with your arms crossed and you can watch them struggle and maybe they'll succeed despite you or maybe they'll fail but wouldn't you rather have them succeed? Um, well my name is Ahmed Awad I'm 30 years old um, I'm originally Palestinian but I was born and raised in the United Arab Emirates in Dubai um, from there I moved to the United States for um, school I went to Western Kentucky University um, I stayed there for five years see now here's where my story begins in the United States mainly and the very first day I was there, I went to Buffalo Wild Wings, you know, like, hey, hey let's have some wings. <laughs> so I went there, and on the door, like, there's a, like an oval glass, so you can see who's coming out and who's going in type thing. Um, so I saw an older gentleman coming out, typical, you know, southern dress, like with a cowboy hat, cowboy boots, the whole nine yards. So out of respect, he's an older guy, out of respect, I opened the door and stepped, with, stepped to the side, and he looks at me and he goes like, you're not from here, are you? I was like, actually, no, I've been here less than 24 hours. You know, I'm excited. It's a new place, you know? And then he looks at me, where did you come from? And I go like, I came from the Middle East. And he's like, he looks at me, his first words is what got me. He looks, you're a terrorist. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm, fur I'm further away from that. Like, I couldn't be further away from that. Like, I have nothing mm -hmm. to do or associate with that. I, I don't like that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just like walked in. And keep in mind, this was less than 24 hours me in the States. Now me being in the south in the United States, it was kind of hard for me. I was doing mechanical engineering, I told you I stayed there for five years, right? It reached to a point where I was genuinely scared for my life. I stopped going to school. I stopped going out. At one point, we were, me and my friends were sitting in a restaurant and there were two of my friends, they were Saudi Arabians. And next thing you know, something plucked at my head. I was like, I thought it could be, you know, like, uh, a waiter who hit me with a tray by mistake, you know, things like that happen sometimes. So I was like, you know, I was like looking outside and there was nobody next to me. So I was shocked. I look over and next thing you know, it's one, one like the young kids who were sitting there threw a chicken wing at my head. And he like, he like, he started yelling, cussing me out. He was like, go back where you came from, you terrorists, you this and you that and you this and you that. And it reached to a point where, like, I'm scared to go out because I'm scared genuinely for my life. I know I'm in America. Everybody has a right to carry. And if I reciprocate any hate from them, or if I reciprocate any um, foul language or anything whatsoever, he could just simply go like, hey, I'm protecting myself. Pong, pa, that thing, you know? So I didn't want to stay in that environment anymore. So this is why I was like, you know what? <laughs> this is time for me to pack up my stuff and head up north where it's kind of safer for me. I came here. I came to Matthew House. How did you get here if you don't um, I had, like, a friend of mine drove me across. Okay. Um, I came here into Canada, everybody was welcome. Which was, to me, uh, for the last two or three years in America, it was kind of hard under Trump's presidency. So, it was, a, it was like, you know, it was a new thing, it was fresh for me. Okay, after three years of literally facing bigotry, facing hate, just because of who I am. I'm an Arab, I'm Muslim, my name is Ahmed. Just like people hate you without even knowing you, which is not fair for me or anybody else, you know. And so I came to Matthew House, and everybody was welcoming, of course, and whatnot. What Matthew House had helped me with, they actually provided me with a family away from my own family. We were like literally one family. We eat sometimes together. We celebrate uh, everything together. Um, we respect each other. We never looked at each other in terms of color, race, ethnicity, culture. That never was an issue here. Live, because I was living in the United States and I faced that daily coming here and seeing these kind of people like who were genuinely trying to help you going above and beyond spending their own private time or their own free time to come to help you I mean that was kind of nice you know what Matthew House have helped me with um, they helped me getting get all my papers in order helped me with a roof over my head 
um, you know, a shelter from the winter and everything. They helped me have the building blocks of a life. They started creating a life for me here. And for that, I think, is priceless. There's nothing that matches that to me right now. I'm struggling through my own life. I've been away from my family for seven years. My sister, when I left, my youngest sister, she couldn't be like when she left, she was so young, she could barely speak a sentence by herself. Last time I spoke to her was over the phone. She was speaking to me in full English, full sentences, full conversations. I've missed so much. And this is why Matthew House here means a lot to me. They gave me a family away from my own. I see kids around, it reminds me of my little sister, you know? Mm -hmm. I see um, mothers taking care of their kids, it reminds me of my own mom. I see fathers going out to work and try to provide for their families, it reminds me of my own dad. It just gave me, it gave me a sense of belonging, you know what I mean? And for that, I'm speechless for Matthew House. I'm, I can't thank them enough for what they do. Mike, he, he went above and beyond to just provide me with a room, provide me with everything that I need for me to be comfortable. A feeling I haven't had in such a long time. And for that, man, I'm pretty grateful. My name is Khaled Omar. I am uh, originally Palestinian, and I was born and lived my entire life in Saudi Arabia. So uh, I was working, the last work that I worked with the international company, the name is Regis, and I worked for seven years as an operation manager. But literally when they changed the rules and everything, so now they call something that they call it Saudization, so which is they have to fire the foreigners and they have to hire the Saudis people. So I keep searching and looking for a, a different job or something, but I couldn't find. After that, they put me in system as a scape. So in this time, I have to take a step that I have to move out better than send me back home, which is to Syria, because I cannot go to Palestinian, because I have Syrian document travel. Um, so I got the American uh, visa for me and my daughter, and we travel from Saudi Arabia to America. We stay for six or seven days. Uh, after that, we uh, fly to Buffalo. From Buffalo, we cross the border in uh, waterfalls. Um, after they ask us some question, they take the uh, biometric and they take the story and what they can, how, how they can help us. They allow me and they say welcome to Canada. Uh, I came here first because I have relatives in uh, Ottawa and in Mississauga, which is two uncles from my mother's side. But I decided to come to Windsor because I think maybe the process will go faster, better than uh, the big cities. So that's why I moved here to Windsor. Uh, after two days, I uh, joined the Matthew House and they support me and help me a lot to fill my paper and document. After that, they uh, give me a place to live with my daughter. And um, yeah, they, they, whatever that I ask them anything to help me or to support me, they, they are always there to help me. And up to date, they are doing the same. Um, now actually I'm, I'm working but still I'm waiting for my hearing to get the approval then I can bring my family still I have my wife and two other uh, kids with my wife. Talk to us quickly about um, what it is to be separated from your family, your wife, your sons and um, what goes through your mind every day. Yeah, actually it's very hard to, to stay without my wife and kids especially now my kids they are growing and sometimes good thanks God that at least we have some apps to, con to contact them. Otherwise, maybe they will forget me. Even my daughter, she's missing her mommy. Sometimes that it happens when, once we arrive. Up to date, maybe once a week or twice a week that she's crying. She want to. She want her mommy. She want her uh, brothers. Um, uh, even for me, it's it's not easy. Now I'm working, but most of the time I cannot manage the time because I have daughter also and I have to go to work. But I cannot work properly. Plus, I cannot stay at home all the time because you know it's not easy to stay alone with, with your daughter. This is my first, first time that I stayed with a kid alone with, without my wife because she is very, usually, you know, the, the mom, they, they care about the kids more than dad. But I try my best and I hope that it won't take long time until I, my, my family will, uh, will arrive and we stay together. If you mind me asking, what, um, how, what were the circumstances surrounding you coming here with your daughter and then your wife and your son staying? If you could just call them together. Yeah, actually because my wife, she's Syrian, so that's why I cannot bring the visa for her after uh, Trump banning the Syrian ca country. So that's why uh, only me and my daughter, she's six years old, um, we applied for the American visa and they gave it to us only. So that's why I decided maybe at least she can uh, go to school here, she can 
uh, explore the world and maybe she can uh, help me to make the process faster so at least um, it, it won't take that long time but now I'm almost a year but till now still nothing happened hopefully that it won't take like that long time more